Y'all see this? This right here? This is my Sony FX6. And for the last year and a half, this has been an absolute workhorse for my workflow and my video production. Not only have I been able to take it for a documentary projects, some brand stuff, even doing commercial work as well, the Sony FX6 has been my favorite cinema camera since I picked it up back in 2021. Now this camera did come out almost three years ago, and now you're starting to see a couple of updates that are coming from different cameras in the mid-range cinema line. But we're gonna talk about the Sony FX6 and what things that I might expect or at least hope for in the Sony FX6 Mark II. Let's talk about it. Now, first things first, we're gonna need to fix this thing. And I mean, like, personally, I gotta fix this thing. I've destroyed the top handle, I get it. But getting a top handle that's going to be optional on the Sony FX6 to get audio is gonna be incredibly important because I feel like this is a pain point for a lot of users on this camera system. Now, the Sony FX6 top handle is great. It's great for handheld shooting. It's big enough to fit inside of a hand. However, once I remove this, I'm not gonna have any professional audio inputs. Now, this does actually have three of them. You have the hot shoe at the top and two XLR inputs. And on the Sony FX6, you only have the scratch mic on the body. So then what ends up happening is that if I have to do things like gimbal work or I have a different rigging setup where I have to remove this, I'm not gonna have professional audio, which might be a gigantic downside to a lot of people that are considering this camera. Hopefully, Sony could actually put a three-point five millimeter jack inside of the Sony FX6 body, especially when I need to be a little bit more versatile or I have some rigs that are gonna be very specific to very specific types of jobs. Next thing is gonna be some of the improvements that I'd love to see in the ND filter on the Sony FX6. Now, the Sony FX6 does have the ability to have NDs and also automatic NDs as well to change your exposure on the fly without you having to make the adjustments yourself. However, once you go from not having the ND to turning the ND filter on, I feel like it goes a little bit too far and you go down a little bit too many stops where I can't make fine adjustments on the low end. I find when I'm using the Sony FX6, I'm using the ND filters, I find even when I need a little bit less exposure just to bring in my look, I either have to turn on the NDs and it's gonna be too dark or I gotta turn them off and I can't keep my aperture in order to make the exposure the way that I want it to. Now on the high end, I do find the Sony FX6, it's great in terms of the max amount of stops. You're gonna get about seven stops of ND on here. However, if you're in really high bright situations, that might not be enough. And some people might actually include another ND to go on top of their glass, which kind of defeats the purpose of the automatic ND filters to begin with. Now I understand, they probably have less stops in their ND compared to something like the Canon C70 that has 10 stops versus Sony 7. However, I wish they would make a little bit of an upgrade or an adjustment and still keep the automatic ND at the same time. Now in terms of some of the image quality improvements that I would love to see on the Sony FX6 Mark II, I'm going to go from the least unreasonable to something that might be a little bit of a long shot. Now, first of all, I wish that we had a long op 4-bit option on the Sony FX6 in terms of its codex. Now, if you haven't noticed this, the Sony FX6 only has two speeds, either all intro, which is the best quality codec you can get on this camera, or something that's gonna be the XAVC-L in the long op, which is great, but it does only have the ability of having 8-bit. Now, with the Sony FX6, and you probably might have experienced it too, you're probably buying this camera to get some of the extra quality that you can get from that camera. And you might not have all the SD card space in the world and you wanna save on a little bit, but you still wanna maintain a 10-bit color space. Now, the hard part about that is that once you go into XAVCL long op, you are gonna get more space, but you're going to lose out because you're not gonna get a 10-bit codec. You only have the option of 8-bit, which personally is a little bit annoying because on the Sony FX3 and the FX30, you can still get the XAVCS out of those cameras and you could get a better codec for file storage and at the same time, you could still maintain that 4K in 10-bit. So hopefully this comes out in like a firmware update or something, or hopefully it's easy to do, but I just wish that was already inside of the camera instead of having to wish and hope that it might be in the Mark II. Now, the next thing that I'm hoping for out of the Mark II of the system is a down sampled image. Now, this might be more relative to the sensor. You might have to change the sensor a little bit, but I am kind of hoping that if we are going to get 4K, that it's down sampled from a higher resolution. Things like the Sony a7 IV, the FX30, and some other cameras do have the option of down sampling from a larger resolution into a 4K image, which means that you're going to get more pixels and more detail in that 4K. I'm not necessarily hoping that the Sony FX6 Mark II has 6K or 8K or any of that craziness, but it would be nice to have some downsample images just to get a little bit more sharpness and a little bit more quality. Now, the more unreasonable thing is going to be hoping to have Sony RAW inside of the Sony FX6 Mark II. And, and I understand there's still a patent out from a certain camera company that doesn't allow all the companies to be able to use internal RAW in some of their cameras. However, you know what? Let me, let me just, I'll scrap it. You know what? Don't give me RAW in the Sony FX6 Mark II. However, if you want to give me 12-bit 444 like the Kin Infinity system, that's more than enough for me to be able to push and pull and get the most out of the color quality out of the Sony FX6. 
Now, don't get it twisted and don't get me wrong. The 10 bit actually looks really good and I'm able to make a lot of things work in terms of the color and the image out of that, but it would be nice just to have that little bit extra in the 12 bit 444 internal to the Sony FX6, especially if we don't have the ability to get an internal raw codec. Now, in order to get better image quality, we might have to make some improvements or some changes to the sensor in the Sony FX6 Mark II if it ever comes out. And the first things first is I wish we kind of had IBIS. Now you can do a bunch of things to get better and more stable footage, like rigging your camera, and there's a bunch of different things you can use. However, I kind of wish they had an in-body stabilization that was in the Sony FX6 Mark II. Now that might actually impact some of the image quality, it might impact some things that the sensor can do if you put IBIS in it. However, for me personally, I use this as a run and gun camera. I'm shooting a lot of handheld and using IBIS is actually incredibly useful. And I'm not really counting on any stabilized prime lenses to come out anytime soon. So it would be a help, but honestly, I don't really see it happening. Now, in terms of some of the sensor improvements that I was hoping to see, I would have thought this would be a little bit more unreasonable. However, give us open gate. There, I said it give us open gate. The reason why is because you already are giving us a three by two sensor inside of the camera. We already have the ability to use more resolution because the sensor size is bigger. So why not just give it to us to be able to use without restrictions? I mean, like it's not gonna stop anybody from buying another camera. It's not gonna stop us from maybe buying an FX9 if we're that type of user or buying an FX3 if we're that type of user if all of the FX line cameras just went with open gate. That way we're gonna be able to choose the different features that are outside of the sensor size and be able to use it. And we'll just base it off the features of the camera itself. The Sony FX6 has a bunch of different features that personally for me make it a better choice than something like the Sony FX3 or the FX30 as an A-cam. And I mean, there's another camera company that's doing open gate right now. There might actually be two companies that are doing it. So I don't really see a reason why not to if we're trying to stay competitive. Now, this one might be a big ask and I don't think it's gonna be in the Sony FX6 Mark II, but I'm hoping it's on the FX9 if there ever is another version of it. And that's gonna be having a global shutter. Now, again, back to the more handheld thing, back to the dock shooting, the run and gun stuff. I use handheld quite a lot and having something like a global shutter is gonna take out some of the jello out of the corners when you're moving the camera back and forth. Now the Sony FX6 does a really good job of its rolling shutter performance, so it actually isn't actually that bad. However, it's just one of those things that makes it a little bit better if they do add it in an FX6 Mark II, especially because by the time it comes out, there's a lot of time to observe the industry and see what different cameras are coming out and to make improvements and adjustments so when that new camera does come out, you're not missing any features that have already come out in previous cameras. All right, so the least sexy, the least interesting features that I wanna see in the FX6 Mark II are also two of the things that are probably the most annoying to me. Now, to be honest, I don't really care that there isn't false color or waveform inside of the camera internally. The screen is actually really, really small and I wouldn't use it on an everyday basis anyways. And to be honest, if I was even to judge false color at the back of a small screen, I'd probably get something wrong. So I'm completely okay with using it on a monitor like my Ninja 5 or my Hollyland M1, that doesn't bother me too much. But what does bother me is the fact that when you wanna play back a clip on the Sony FX6, the system doesn't make any sense. Now, if you do a single tap on any of the handles on your Sony FX6, it's actually going to jump the clip. But if you wanna do a fast forward, you're gonna to have to hold in either direction, backwards or forwards to rewind or fast forward, which is a little bit frustrating, especially if you're not used to that workflow. I hope in the Sony FX6 Mark II, they give you the ability to scrub through footage fairly easily, especially because when I'm working on client projects, I wanna be able to scrub through footage and show them what's going on without either overshooting or undershooting when I'm fast forwarding or rewinding. And the only other thing I wanna see out of the menu settings and actually just might be an eternal feature to the camera is give us anamorphic support. Nowadays, there are so many companies that have affordable anamorphic lenses that are out now. And now more than ever, a lot of cameras are going to need the anamorphic support so you could actually have the footage de-squeeze for you in post without having to do a bunch of math or adjustments in camera or in your editing program. Now the Sony FX3 and FX30 did get a firmware update where you can get a little bit of anamorphic support, but it does have two caveats. One, you only have the two options of 1.33 times and two times, and at the same time, it doesn't actually de-squeeze the footage in camera. It'll give you a preview that's gonna be in your monitor, but once you put it on your computer, it's still undesqueezed footage. You're still gonna to have to do that while you're editing in post. Something I wish that happens in the Sony FX6 Mark II is that you get that anamorphic support for not only 1.33 times and two times, but things like 1.5, 1.6, and 1.8. To be fair, there's a couple of cameras that do that that are a little bit lower on the totem pole, and I don't think it's too much to ask that the anamorphic support in the FX3 and the FX30 can be a little bit expanded on and actually just done in camera. Now, to be completely honest, those are just a couple of nitpicks and hopes and dreams that I'm hoping for with the Sony FX6 Mark II. Well, 
I mean, this isn't the Sony FX6 Mark II, but if there was one, this would it would be my hand right now because I'm probably going to pick it up. Now, if you are going to ask me if I will pick up the Sony FX6 Mark II when it releases, you best believe I'm probably going to be the first in line and I'm willing to fight you, your mama, your grandma, your auntie, anybody in front of me in order for me to get that camera first to add that into my workflow. Uh, unless any one of those people can actually fight, in which I'll just patiently wait behind them. But anyways, that's the end of the video and I want to talk about some things about the Sony FX6 and what I would love out of a Mark II version. Now, leave a comment down below. What are some of the things that you would love to see in the Sony FX6 Mark II? Did I miss anything or are some things a little bit too unreasonable to ask for a mid-range cinema camera? But if you want to see more videos, there's probably some over here and they're probably also on the Sony FX6 as well. But I'll see you in the next one. Peace.